Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Patricia Hauserman. Good afternoon. I don't do well at lecterns. Um, before I start, I just want to say that I talk to corporate boards a lot, and having to speak in front of MAS is terrifying. I'm fine with them, but this is a far more intimidating crowd. Having said that, I'm more of a Jane Jacobs kind of gal than a, you know, uh, than uh, Robert Moses, excuse me. Today I want to talk about building repositioning and how we can change not only New York City, but the, many of the cities around the world through using preservation in a new way to change the buildings that we already have. As some of you may know, New York City has 400 million square feet of commercial office space. That's a very large canvas upon which to draw, a large canvas of existing occupied space. It's very unusual that we would have buildings become available that are empty. A lot of the buzz recently is about all the new development. Uh, one Vanderbilt, for instance, and the World Trade Center complex on the west side, Manhattan, Brookfield's Manhattan West, and the uh, related Hudson Yards project. But if you take all of this compared to the commercial office space available in New York, it's only 6% of the commercial office property market here in New York. That leaves a lot of square footage to be dealt with. 75, over 75% of the commercial office space in New York was built before 1980. 45% of the commercial office space was built between 1950 and 1980. There are some buildings that are going to work with the areas in which they exist, the Plaza District being one of them. The building in the foreground at 425 Park Avenue is about to start. It's a very dynamic building repositioning, but it may not represent the vast bulk of the buildings that are out there uh, that need something done with them over the course of the next few years in order to keep New York competitive. Running analytics on all five boroughs and taking buildings that are over 250,000 square feet built during that 30-year post-war period, it's a stark uh, picture that comes up. Most of these buildings, or a lot of these buildings, are underperforming. They were built for a whole different set of standards than we have now with our emerging technology. Uh, the buildings are underperforming with MEP systems. The facades of many of these buildings are failing, and if they are not failing now, they will be shortly because they are living beyond their anticipated life cycle that they were built for uh, back, in the, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We're having a technical difficulty. <laughs> this, is it. this is the story. This is 300 buildings, and as you can see, they're concentrated in Midtown East and Lower Manhattan on the east side. These are the stories that we need to work on to tell a whole new, pic tell a whole new story for the city of New York. The community benefits are obvious. If we go in and we take buildings that are occupied in communities that are in transition, this is Brookfield Place. It was the, well, the World Financial Center. Brookfield has taken it, incorporated dining, entertainment, and shopping to meet the needs of the 60,000 residents that have moved into this area in the last 20 years. We need to take these older buildings and make them more accessible to transportation and also incorporate entertainment and uh, the work environment so that people can work, play, come into New York and grow the city and the city's uh, vibrancy. This is a building at 330 Madison Avenue. This represents the before and after and how we can reset the leasing landscape. Uh, this property required a building overclad. It was about 50 years old. Uh, they upgraded the MEP infrastructure and modernized all the public spaces and completely reset the leasing landscape for the Grand Central Corridor. There are many buildings in Lower Manhattan and speaking to MAS's mission, that are beautiful buildings that aren't meeting the needs of the local community or the business community, depending upon the zoning. 
there are many opportunities for taking pre-war buildings and through adaptive reuse, making them more plausible for the econ economy that exists now in the use. The most important legacy that we're going to leave with, from building repositioning is the ability to give the next generation a New York City that's more sustainable. By incorporating green roofs, by upgrading the energy performance of buildings, and a key component of this, earlier in my talk, I talked about the facades. We need a, a greater degree of flexibility with the zone green facade variances in order to accommodate the needs of all these occupied buildings. It's difficult for an owner to take an occupied building and put a new skin on the building or overclad the building and stay within the zoning requirements. Uh, perhaps with a bit more flexibility with CCD1 variances, we will be able to take these 300 buildings and create a better landscape for the whole city and a, and a quality of life for those that work in these buildings. There are many ways to reposition a building. Uh, there are many challenges and there are many opportunities. Whether it's reskinning a building, uh, recladding a building, in this case 1095 Avenue of the Americas, overcladding a building such as 330 Madison Avenue, or with many masonry buildings doing both to uh, improve the performance of the building, both financially and for the occupants of the building. The real challenge for all of us here is to step up, use our collective, creative, uh, cre collective creativity to answer this challenge and make New York City the place of infinite possibilities because that's the canvas we have now and it's crying out for us to really use our collective imagination to solve the challenges. Thank you.